that's what some of you received as part of your prizes. So let's talk more about memory and brain health, which is really my passion. I mean, I don't want wrinkles, and I want to look good, but really what I want is to not get dementia or Alzheimer's, to maintain optimal brain function. Because I can't imagine anybody who ends up with Alzheimer's and dementia expecting to be there, right? Uh, Suzanne Summers is fond of saying she's never been to a nursing home and met anyone who wanted to be there. And yet, so many people, based on the decisions they make on a daily basis, are headed that direction. So I want to give you more information to empower you about the importance of your brain and help you with your memory if you're already struggling with memory problems. There are essentially three stages of cognitive decline or brain deterioration that are associated with aging. The first is preclinical or pre-mild cognitive impairment. You will not see any change in social or occupational ability. And this can be detected 20 years before significant symptoms develop. So if you end up with dementia or Alzheimer's at 80, start it at 50. And if you make it to 85, you have a 50% chance of having dementia and Alzheimer's. So anybody in here who's 50, you got a 50-50 shot if you make it to 85, unless you do something about it now. Because it can take 20 to 30 years before you get there, which is why we now require neurocognitive testing for all of our patients in my clinic, because I absolutely believe the brain is precious, and I want to prevent as many cases of dementia and Alzheimer's as I can on this planet. So the first stage is preclinical might not even have any symptoms or they might be really mild. The second stage is called mild cognitive impairment or MCI. You'll notice a couple of changes in your thinking and in your memory. You may have some problems performing complex tasks. Again, this can be detected with neurocognitive testing. That's why we do it. It takes you more time or maybe you're less efficient or you make more mistakes. The third stage is Alzheimer's or dementia, which affects daily function. And many of you may know that we're now an Amen certified clinic because I've learned um, how to interpret spec scans and taken all of Dr. Amen's CME. And we've looked at many, many scans of patients with dementia and Alzheimer's. There's not a whole lot left to reverse at that point. So I know this country is obsessed with finding the magic bullet drug and a lot of money is being put into drug research for Alzheimer's and dementia. And I don't understand it because we can prevent it. And it's a lot easier to prevent than it is to treat. So what is mild cognitive impairment? The second stage, MCI. It, it actually starts with initial changes in your brain's processing speed. Again, we can detect this with neurocognitive testing. This starts in the early 30s or the 40s. You slow down. Not all people with mild cognitive impairment will get Alzheimer's, but all Alzheimer's patients had mild cognitive impairment at one point, so it makes sense to test for it and do something about it early. Again, 15 or 20 to 30 years before dementia and Alzheimer's are detected. And you now know that if you live to be 85, you have a 50-50 shot. And it's not luck. Let's talk about some of the facts about Alzheimer's. 5.4 million people currently in the United States have Alzheimer's. There are 33.9 million worldwide. 18% of the baby boomers in this room will develop Alzheimer's. We're calling that the silver tsunami because we don't have the resources to deal with it. <laughs> Literally. It's a very expensive disease to treat. You don't die right away. Not sure how we're going to have the money to take care of people. When I started my book, doing research on my book, which was seven years ago, it was every 71 seconds someone developed Alzheimer's. Now it's every 69 seconds. One in eight people over 65 have dementia. Again, 50% over 85. Alzheimer's is expensive. The direct and indirect costs of Alzheimer's and other dementias are $183 billion a year. And this is a new study that came out from Mount Sinai just this September, looking at the last five years of life and how much we spend on somebody the last five years of life. Alzheimer's disease, by far the most money. The average family will spend $66,000 for the last five years of life out of pocket, Medicare is not covering it, to take care of somebody with Alzheimer's the last five years of their life. 32,000 for cancer, 38,000 for cardiovascular disease, and 38,500 for diabetes. Very expensive. Alzheimer's is preventable. Have you all heard that Alzheimer's isn't preventable? That's a bunch of crap. Alzheimer's is absolutely preventable, unless you have a rare genetic kind. 
These are some of the things that we know are risk factors for Alzheimer's. And this information was actually published in the Lancet Neurology, which is a pretty well-respected periodical in 2011. Diabetes, known risk factor for Alzheimer's, totally avoidable. Hypertension, obesity, smoking, cognitive inactivity or low educational attainment, and physical inactivity. These are all risk factors for Alzheimer's. They're all something we can do something about. 50% of cases of Alzheimer's in this country right now are attributed to these factors. 50% of cases of Alzheimer's in this country are attributed to those factors. We'll see a 10 to 25% reduction in all seven risk factors could potentially prevent this many cases in the U.S. alone, almost half a million cases possibly. Let's talk about the warning signs, because some of you may be saying, I wonder if I already have some of the warning signs of Alzheimer's, right? Or maybe my mom or my spouse. First warning sign of Alzheimer's, memory loss that disrupts daily life. So this includes recently learned information, important dates or events. Challenges in planning or solving problems, so de decreased concentration or taking a very long time to do things. Difficulty completing familiar tasks, like driving to a familiar location. And this information, if you forget it or you want to review it later, you can find at alzheimers.org. Number four, confusion with time or place. So getting lost or losing track of time or what season it is, not understanding time. Trouble understanding visual images or spatial relationships. So trouble with reading, judging distance, or determining color or contrast. Problems with words when speaking or writing. Struggling with vocabulary or calling things by the wrong name. Losing things with an inability to retrace your steps. One of the screening questions I always have for patients is, what did you eat for breakfast yesterday? What did you eat for lunch? What did you eat for dinner? You should be able to retrace your steps and know what you did. And if you lose something, you should be able to find it. Retrace your steps. Poor judgment or decision making. So lack of judgment with money or inattention to grooming and cleanliness can be a warning sign that you have Alzheimer's or someone you love does. Withdrawal from work or social activities. And changes in mood and personality. This includes confusion, suspicion, fear, depression, or anxiety. So if it's a significant change, that can be a, a warning sign for Alzheimer's. And one of the ways that you're going to prevent Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia is to enhance healthy blood flow. So your blood vessels, anybody go to that exhibit that was at OMSI for the uh, body world? Those are the, that's the vascular system of the head. Look at all the blood vessels that go to your face and neck and brain. It's unbelievable. Those blood vessels carry oxygen. They carry nutrients and they carry hormones to your brain and they carry away waste. So if you have narrowed or hardened arteries or poor circulation because you don't exercise, then you're going to have decreased blood flow and possibly brain damage from that. So you want to optimize your brain. And how do you do that? You follow the eight steps. That's really one of the targets of my eight steps. You stop smoking. Your life depends on it. You prevent blood clots. You avoid certain medications that are known memory disruptors. This includes pain medications. It includes anti-anxiety drugs like Xanax, clonazepam you might be taking to first sleep at night. They disrupt memory proteins in the brain. And maybe know your genetic risk if you're at an increased risk. So you might be hearing more and more about brain-derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF. This is a protein in the brain that helps maintain connections between neurons and make new neurons. So it actually keeps your brain healthy. And guess what increases BDNF? Exercise. And the effect can last for three days. Learning new, new material, new information increases BDNF. Decreasing stress, vitamin D and fish oil, and estradiol and testosterone. They've all been shown to increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor in your brain. You want to stimulate your brain through variety and curiosity. Remember those Rubik's Cubes? That's another, that dates us. Do you guys know what Rubik's Cubes are? You Stimulate your brain through variety and curiosity. So learn new things. You can do puzzles, social interaction, very important. 
There are some wonderful websites with brain training exercises, and I often prescribe them when I get people's neurocognitive testing back. This is one I like a lot, Lumosity.com, because they have a free subscription, and then you can get an upgraded one, and they're keeping data. And you can actually keep your own data so you can watch yourself improve. And this is a website that I was just recently introduced to. This is another uh, certified aiming clinic, BrainGystics.com. And this is um, psychologist Arlene Benyoya Struger. Arlene, are you here? Oh, she was invited and wanted to come. But this is her, this is her organization. They're in Hillsborough. And essentially what they are is a brain fitness center. So they've developed tools to help people through assessment and through treatment improve their brain function. Jenna here. This is Eric Braverman's book, and he gives a lot of tips in his book about improving your brain. There are three that are my favorite. So if you want to improve your memory, these are three things that you can do immediately starting right now in this moment. Make each exposure the most sensory experience possible. It's part of the reason in our seminar we have you tasting chocolate, we have you watching things, we have you listening things, we even have you up and moving around. The more sensory experiences you have, the more likely you commit things to memory. De-spam your environment, right? So if you have one of those computers where you are constantly being interrupted by whatever isn't really important, de-spam it. You don't need to be at everyone's beck and call. You want to minimize interruptions if you're going to improve your memory. And replay experiences that meant a lot in your mind or talk to somebody else about it about an hour after you learn it. So again, one of the things I recommend if you wanted to get something out of this seminar besides a talking head is that later, maybe when you go home or you're having some tea or you're having a glass of wine, you go through the seminar and look at what you circled that meant something to you so you can improve your memory. You can actually learn it. Very important tool. And writing it down and talking about it, again, helps lay down new memories. 